So I would encourage you to uh, worship fully tonight. We're going we're gonna to go deep into the Word. This is a long sermon, so settle in. And um, before you leave, worshipfully hit that joy box. Yes, members of the church know that ch churches will be planted all over the world from what we do there. If you're not sure how to give here, ask somebody. So here's what my invitation to you. Pull up a lawn chair and join us for the next 13 weeks. Because here's what's going to happen. Jesus has just crested the hill. You're sitting on a hillside, lawn chair if that's what you need, blanket, probably some fried chicken if you're an American Christian, right? And the king is going to come teach you what the kingdom's like. The king is going to teach you what the kingdom's like. Let's start here. Jesus is here to usher in a kingdom of grace, not legislate morality. And let's just declare this up front. Read that with me. It is his kingdom. Now, okay, now, here. Now, read this with me. It is his kingdom. He can define it as he wills. You really believe that? You, if you really believe that, if you came in here with a posture of humility that Jesus is going to teach you, not Tim, what his kingdom is like for the next 13 weeks, you will be radically changed for the good. Our message, our message, the church's real message, not the message that the church for the last 100 years has delivered sometimes, the real church's message is that the world should not fear us. Jesus wants to set his kingdom up so that the world does not fear us. Here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to liberate the world from evil with love. Morality comes. Morality comes, but not from yelling and not from winning arguments. The Pharisees tried that. The modern church on occasion has tried that. Instead, here's what you need to understand. We need new hearts. We don't need morality yelled out. We need new hearts. Jesus said, seek ye first. You like that little King James for all you old timers, right? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek Jesus, and all these things will be added unto you, new desires. Well, what is the kingdom of God? Here we go, the greatest sermon ever. The greatest sermon, and, I, and because Jesus did it, not because Tim's up here, all right? For sure. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. If you have a Bible, join me in Matthew chapter 5. It says this, Jesus, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. They said, oh, this is a good opportunity here. We got the king. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, okay, taught them for the next 13 weeks what the kingdom of God is. Verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Anybody interested in here in the kingdom of heaven? I don't mean like when you die. I don't mean like when you die. I mean like right now. And nobody else? Just three of you? Interested in the kingdom of heaven, in this place, on this planet. So Jesus began these beatitudes by describing the kind of humble outpouring that comes from a heart already won by the power of the gospel. Some, you, if you hear this mistaught, you'll hear, if you're poor in spirit, you will hear, you will receive the kingdom of God. What he's saying is if the kingdom of God has entered you, you'll see poor in spirit. Am I tracking with that? Got to get that? Correct. It's not what we bring to the table that brings on the blessing of God. It creates a writing kind of like this. This was written by a guy named Top Lady. That's kind of interesting. All right? It says, nothing in my hand I bring. Simply to the cross I cling. Can anybody else say that with me tonight? Say that with me. Second line. Simply to the cross I cling. If you just said that, you can take communion here tonight because you're a believer. Like, like if that's true... Simply to the cross I cling. Naked. Now, don't, don't do that. Come to, the, come to thee for dress. Come to thee, God, for dress. Helpless. Look to thee for grace. Look to thee for grace. Next screen. Foul. I to the fountain fly. Listen to this. Wash me, Savior, or I die. Oh, man. Man, that is poor in spirit. But let's start here. Let's start by defining what's blessed. Like, we get all the Beatitudes, like, blessed, blessed. What does bless mean? It means God has cast an eye on you. You want God's eye on you. 
He's cast his eye on you in a, in a good way. God's power, his love, his grace, his mercy has settled on you. If you're in this room tonight and you've got a sense that all of that stuff has settled on you, you are a blessed person. Blessed in this room tonight. So do we not think that's a good thing? Right? I mean, like, is there anything better than God going, I'm setting my eye on you with all of the good stuff I've got. That's a good day. I don't know about you, but I want it. Anybody else? I want it. So what is poor in spirit? If that's what blessed is, what is poor in spirit? Well, the world has some ideas. You've been taught really poorly by some of your culture what poor in spirit is. Poor in spirit uh, it, from a lie of the world is it, it's self-deprecating. In other words, I am, I am so low, I am nothing, woe is me. Everybody tracking with that? That's self-deprecating. That is, let me just say this to the camera, that is poverty gospel, Okay? That is poverty gospel, and it is false humility 99.9% of the time. That is not poor in spirit. If I consider myself low in stature, here's the way that plays out in a sinful way. If I consider myself low in stature, so low that I even deny what God has promised, like all the riches of heaven, sonship, daughtership, here's what I can do. I can justify my way in sin. That's false poverty. That's false humility. That's death. Self-deprecation is never poor in spirit. Second lie, the world will tell you that poor in spirit will get you nowhere. The poor world will tell you that poor in spirit will get you nowhere. Right? That to succeed in this life, here's what you need. You need more rich in you. More rich of you. Succeeding is what gives us value. Isn't that what you were taught? Isn't it the great American dream? That succeeding is what defines you. Succeeding is what gives us value. Not humility. Succeeding. Some of you just got pressed on because you were raised in the great American dream. And God is going to have to rock that out of us. Because my question for you, how does that work for you? It feels good. for. It's like all sin. It feels good for a while. And then nothing because that's not what you were created for well what is poor in spirit poor in spirit is a growing awareness that i am completely and utterly morally spiritually and emotionally bankrupt without the righteousness of christ completely which he earned for us at the cross like like back to the first thing, said, simply to the cross I cling. If I'm clinging to anything else, I'm not poor in spirit because I'm not bankrupt in me and filled with Jesus, filled with his spirit. In other words, I'm corrupt to the core without the love and grace of the gospel. Until we have a realization that I'm corrupt to the core without the love and grace of the gospel, we will not experience poor in spirit. And you're not going to like what Jesus says about that. You are simply not going to like that. If you're still clinging to something in your life, saying, Jesus, you can have some areas of my life, but you can't have others, you're going to not be excited about what Jesus tells you about that in the Sermon on the Mount. See, poor in spirit is that we have experienced the greatness and glory of Jesus in every aspect of our life. There are less of our desires and more of his. And then, then the riches come. Then you are declared princes and princesses of a great and glorious king. Jesus is clearly superior to everything else you would try. So that would make us poor, poor in spirit. If he's superior to everything else that there possibly could be, I cling to him for any claim to identity. Or not. If this humility does not show up, listen closely. If this poor in spirit does not show up. Either we will not experience the kingdom in the next life, like that's the, the ultimate tragedy, right? He says, if it has come, you will be poor in spirit. It's not like this, here's, here's option number 34 of the Christian life. It's option number one. That if you have experienced my grace, you will experience poor in spirit. Because if it hasn't shown up, we will not see heaven because 
we've never experienced grace. We've not truly believed. Or we are a Christian who for a time will not experience the kingdom of heaven here because we are currently walking as an arrogant unbeliever. Is that anybody other than me sometimes? Nobody else in the room kind of walks in that? Where, where I have no poor in spirit because I'm thinking, I can handle this. I got this, Jesus. You don't need you. Take a, take a vacation. I'll fill in as God for a while. Is it just me? See, this beatitude, let me, let me, if you didn't hear anything else, hear this. This beatitude opens the sequence because the Spirit, listen to me, the Spirit will not work with arrogance. He won't hate you. But he will not work with arrogance. And so the rest of the Beatitudes are impossible without receiving this one. God is clear that arrogance is declaring war on him. And he will pour blessing upon blessing and more of himself and more of his joy and more of all who he is on the humble. Here's what this did for me. I just wrote this out. It went crazy. His everythingness reveals my nothingness. When I see Jesus, see, see, a lot of us walk around with these mundane experiences with Jesus. If you see Jesus for who he is, that's why you should read the Bible and ask the Spirit to just like reveal who Jesus is because when you see his everythingness, it will reveal your nothingness. You'll see, I am nothing. I'm poor in spirit. Everybody catching that? So if you're struggling with this, it's because you haven't seen his everythingness. Then my nothingness ushers in his everythingness. It's a perfect circle. We walk in the cycle of sin, right? Those of you that have done conquering addiction. And he says, I've got one on the reverse side of that that works like this. So that as long as there's any of me left, I will quench something good that the Spirit wants to do in me. If there's any of me left, I will go, not there, Spirit. You can't have that part. So I have, to, I have to become nothing. That's hard for an American to say, isn't it? Like, let's go win the Olympics. Gold medals. Make us nothing. I must decrease so that he may increase. Verse 4. <laughs> We're just getting started. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Everybody says, oh, man, great funeral stuff. That has nothing to do with funerals. Okay? So here's what happens. The first beatitude, the one we just looked at, poor in spirit, strikes our head. Look at me. Strikes our head, strikes our intellect, hits our heart with a realization and epiphany. Some of you just had some light bulbs come on. Some of you are still fighting the spirit. Pray right now that the spirit click your light bulb on. An epiphany that I must be poor in spirit. I must become nothing so that Christ can become everything. His everythingness makes... Me nothingness, that's not very good English, right? It'll get, it'll get better. This second beatitude strikes our emotions. You ready? So once again, let's look at some lies. The lie would be, blessed are sad, moping Christians. That's what people read when they read this. That's a lie. Or second lie, blessed are those who cry constantly over their difficulties. Woe is me. And so some of you saw on Facebook this week, moping is not mourning. Moping is not mourning. Let me teach you what mourning here is. Here's what we are to mourn. First, sin. You want to mourn something? Mourn sin. We are vastly more sinful than we ever realized, and Jesus is vastly a bigger sever than we, Savior than we ever imagined. We must learn to weep over sin. Weep over it. Hate our sin. Our sin should, should, should cause us to be poor in spirit when we see it. See, that's a starting point. The weight should crush us. But then we don't stay crushed. The good news of the gospel, the good news of the cross, is that we don't stay crushed because we saw our sin for what it really is. We weep no more because the penalty has been paid. Am I tracking with that? That ought to make Christians say amen. Yeah. And then the second thing we are to mourn is sins of the whole world. The brokenness of the world, especially locally, should break. 
because I looked into a car today that a mother was just like nearly beating the tar out of two kids. And I thought, I thought, oh my God, I want to jump out of this vehicle, first of all, and wreck her, like physically. But then I just started praying for her because her sin broke me. In the moment, I didn't think like, well, I'm glad it's those kids and I'm glad they're in that car. Her sin broke me, and so I just started praying for her. Here's what will happen if this hits us, is we'll become missionaries. You can't help but become a missionary if this actually hits you. You cannot, you cannot look upon situations around you that the brokenness of the world is destroying families, it's destroying kids, it's destroying the world, rotting flesh is all over the place, and not become a missionary. You've got to be pretty, a pretty callous Christian to go, I don't care. To hell with those people. I, I mean, I'm trying to get to Starbucks. Don't you know? I've got this, I got this uh, sporting event that's really important. So my question is, are you struggling as a missionary? Let me just tell you this. Until you are broken and mourning that the people around you are headed to hell, both in this life and in their current situation, you will hoard your time and your money. Until you are broken by it. Until you are mourning mourning the brokenness around you, you will say, this is my time, this is my money. You think this beatitude is pretty serious? For those who mourn. For those who mourn. Let me wrap up this beatitude for you. Jesus is saying, unless you have mourned your sins, unless you mourn the sins of the world, you are not a Christian. You're still in your sin and hell-bound. Maybe tonight you will meet Jesus. Maybe he just delivered a wake-up call. Maybe he just delivered a wake-up call. It says, I never really mourned my sin. I've never really mourned the brokenness of the world. But the promise of this beatitude is good. Isn't it great that Jesus, when he presses us like that, always leaves us with so much hope? He says, he says oh, by the way, you get the Holy Spirit. They shall be comforted. I read that, they shall meet the capital C comforter. That's good news. And the spirit, the the comforter says, take heart, my child. I know you see your sin and your sin has broken you. But the great Jesus has forgiven you. And take comfort. Restoration is coming. I'm restoring the small things now. Look around you. Look at the people in this room. I've, I've taken some of them from brokenness and I'm restoring them. And those... Those, that woman in that car and those two small children, I'll come and I'll restore them. And if it doesn't happen now, it'll happen when I put my foot down in the Mount of Olives, so says Zechariah chapter 7. When I break the clouds and I set my foot down on the Mount of Olives and on my return, all things will be restored. Yeah. So we can mourn now. We can mourn now, but the comforter comes. Blessed are the those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Verse 5 says, Blessed blessed are the meek. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Well, what the heck is meek? We don't use that word, right? Well, contextually, let me, let me roll it out for you a couple little different ways here. First of all, it's power under control. Everybody hears meek, and some dude goes, I ain't meek. Until I say, well, it's like secretariat, meek. Power. One of the greatest strength things in the world under complete control. Most dudes that are powerful are completely out of control, right? Think about the dudes that you know in your life, especially, that are powerful. They're completely out of control. God says, my spirit comes upon you and you become meek. You become full of humility, but powerful. How many of you see Jesus like... Man, I hate the pictures of, like, Jesus, like, is this wimpy little dude? Like, looks like, 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 dude, do some CrossFit and eat something, will you? That's, that wasn't Jesus. Jesus wasn't a pretty dude, Isaiah said, but he was, I got a feeling, as a carpenter guy and a guy who could take the beating that we've kind of all imagined in our, in our heads and then took a, took a while to die on a, on a cross. He, that, dude was, that dude was strong. And if he, you know, I don't know what his body looked like exactly, but he walked around with, like, some strength. I, all I know is that when he said, hey, demon, get out. What happened? They got out. They got out. Strength. 
under control. We say all the time around here that to be a disciple that can enter into mission with other disciples, because I don't know if you've noticed, but when you enter in with other people, like on a deep level, it's really messy. I don't know, anybody had that experience? Here's what you got to have. We talk about this all the time. You got to have some strength. You got to have alligator skin and a warm heart. Like somehow compassion, right, has to shine. But usually compassionate people, when they get punched in the stomach, they, they like bend over for like a month or six years or 40 because there's no alligator skin. But Jesus says you can have both. You can, you can be strong and full of compassion and love. That's meekness. Okay? Everybody track with what it is now? Strength under compassionate control. How do you get it? Trust the sovereign God. When you trust the Father, you'll actually develop this. You can open yourself up, take a shot, and be okay. Because you know the Father's got your back. You know the Father's going to recover you quickly. What did Jesus do? First Peter chapter 2. Let me just read this to you. For this you, you have been called exactly what he's talking about, suffering for Jesus' sake. He says, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you may follow in his steps. Look at this. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, when they punched him in the face, when they called him every name in the book, what would we do? We would fight, right? I hate you. If nothing else on social media, we get like nasty with a keyboard, right? When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. Why? When he suffered, he did not threaten. Why? Look at this. Continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. I said, my daddy's going to take care of this, dog. I don't have to pay any attention to you because my daddy's going to take care of this eventually. He's either going to bring you to faith and we're going to have no trouble reconciling or, he, or <laughs> it's coming. It's coming. The, the father's going to take care of things. So Jesus, here's what he did. He trusted the father. He was meek. He, he didn't have to revile in return because he trusted the Father. He actually, in the middle of painful persecution, trusted. Is that you? Is that me? In the middle of painful persecution, do we, do we trust? Or do we say, I got the, no, wait a minute. I'm, I'll be dang if that's going to happen. I, I got vengeance right here. And so what happens is this is a call, listen, to set down pride, which produces the opposite. You know you're prideful if some of these are you. Pride produces this, harshness. Mean, mean is obviously the, obvious, uh, the opposite of meek. But listen to me real close, all of you sensitive people out there. Stern is not mean. Listen to me. Stern is not mean. Some of you need to toughen up a little bit. Like, like when G if Jesus comes and talks sternly to you, but lovingly to you, receive that. Not, not everybody who speaks sternly to you is beating you down. But Jesus was boldly confrontational, but he was never harsh. There was never any question that the people he was speaking to, he loved them. Okay? Second one's grasping. I know I'm full of pride when I'm grasping. I got to get mine. So here's the simple deal there. If you don't set the will of God and the needs of others in front of your own desires, you will never see meekness. Do I need to say that again? If you don't set the will of God and the needs of others in front of your own, you will never see meekness. It's not coming. It will not come. God doesn't play with arrogant. He doesn't get in the sandbox with arrogant. Next one, vengeful. I will get my pound of flesh and not leave it to the Father. Here's the deal. The vengeful will never inherit the kingdom. They'll never inherit the earth, the promise of this beatitude. The vengeful will never inherit the earth. They're too busy trying to be God to let him be God, and there can only be one. And then the uncontrolled. Let me just say this. If you have a rage side to you, you need to receive some healing. Rage is the, pretty much the opposite of meek. Meekness comes by walking in the Spirit, yoking ourselves to Jesus. Are you yoked with Jesus? I would ask you to analyze when you rage, are you yoked with Jesus? It's pretty hard to say I'm yoked with him and doing something he would not do. And then you have to trust the first two Beatitudes, that poor in spirit works, 
and that mourning works. Rage goes away. Rage goes away unless you need heal or unless you need a demon chased off of you, which is possible as well. Verse 6. Everybody having a good time? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Listen to this. For they shall be satisfied. If I had anything for Americans, this would be it, man. Like, like I watch Americans search to be satisfied, and it's frightening. It's frightening. Just think about the ways we try to be satisfied. And this says, a promise from God. You want God's hand on you with the Father eye on you? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So do you ever consider what you hunger and thirst for? When you wake up in the morning, what do you hunger and thirst for? Not in a physical way. Food, yeah, but also we hunger and thirst for violence. We hunger and thirst for excitement. That's the big one right now. Like, like, like I, I'm watching kids think that they have to be entertained 24-7. And I'm thinking, that is not hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's hungering and thirsting for excitement. There's got to be some repentance there. Erotica, materialism. I used to have an insatiable desire to be a great athlete. It was an insatiable, consuming, idolatrous desire. And it took me over because I was hungry by human terms. And it, <laughs> it frighteningly and woefully turned out well. I wish I'd have been a dismal failure. It would have been easier to be poor in spirit. Sometimes we wish for success, and it's the last thing we should have prayed for. But my hunger for it, to be ultimate, listen to me, was destructive. Anything that is wrong in my life, any remaining resentment that some folks from my past have for me, anything that I still look at my wife and go, does she trust me? Is she trusting me right now? Comes from that thing being ultimate. So be careful what is ultimate in your life. Be careful. Because you don't want to be my age and looking at somebody and wondering, do they trust me? Because of pain you inflicted from something being ultimate other than hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of Christ for a whole lot of your life. We must be, listen to me, desperately hungry for the righteousness of Christ. Are you desperately hungry for his righteousness? Because here's some lies that we believe that the pleasures and cares of this world will satisfy some of you are still convinced in the room that some of the things that you are pursuing will satisfy. And I'm telling you right now, I've tried them all, whatever it is. I'm almost like, I can stand before you almost like Solomon in Ecclesiastes and say, you can't try anything that I haven't tried to satisfy, and it will not work. Just like he did. The gospel truth is, only the righteousness of Christ will satisfy you want to lay your head on a pillow at night? Experience a day where you walked with Jesus and everything you did walked out in his righteousness. You want to sleep well? That's it. There is nothing else you can try or do that will be a sleep aid. We have a multi-billion dollar sleep aid industry in this country and what, company, country and what we need is Christ. His all-satisfying abilities. And then we have another lie that we believe that we can set our own righteousness. That may have been you at one time, might still be you sitting in the room tonight, thinking that you can set what righteousness is. So I just ask you, look around the world where that's a prominent culture. How's that working out? A hundred people were shot in Chicago last weekend where everybody's going, I will tell you what's righteous. That's where it comes from. You understand that all, of the, every, all that gun violence that happened in Chicago where we can a hundred people shot. By the way, if you, if you don't think the world's racist, if that happened in anywhere in white America, there would be, the National Guard would be all over that place, and we would make sure that people were safe. And yet, that didn't happen, and the, but the reason that it happened was that people said, I will tell you what's righteous. I can define my own righteousness. The perfect righteousness of Christ is a promise. You are walking in the Spirit when that becomes good, right, and healthy inside of you. And you're walking in the flesh when the, when the word repulses. Like, I really don't want to read the Bible today because every time I read the Bible, I don't feel very good afterwards. Anybody ever been there? Like, like, I, like that thing needs, needs to catch some dust for a little while because when I pick that thing up, I don't feel so good. 
when we're when we're hungering and thirsting for the righteousness of God, we can't wait for it to run something that's not about the righteousness of Christ out of us. We can't wait. There's something in me that doesn't look like Jesus. Let's rock this word. Let's go to church. Tim's crazy, but he, he'll have something to say like that. You can always tell. Example, I had a very difficult conversation this week with a member of our church, and I used these words. This is what Jesus says about this. Anybody ever sat with me and that's what I said? Let me just tell you what Jesus says about this. Right? And then I cringed. I literally cringed. Because it doesn't always turn out well for me. Sometimes when I do that, folks are hungry for words of the culture or words of the flesh, for their flesh to be actually built up over the righteousness of Christ, and then they walk out of my life. And that's painful. I know pastors who don't say what Jesus says anymore because they're tired of people walking out of their life. It hurts too bad. I've got alligator skin, so I'll keep telling you. Hopefully the warm heart will make it come with love and compassion, but I'm going to keep telling you. And this, sometimes like this case, there was a hunger and thirst for Jesus and his righteousness, and so this conversation went well. But honestly, we just need to, at the end of the day, we need to remember a day when our affections were stoked for Jesus. Do you remember a day that you couldn't wait to tell somebody about Jesus? Like, like Jesus so invaded your soul that you go, this is too good to be true. This is scandalous. It's too good to be true. I've got to tell people. And then at some point, we get inoculated against that by church or something, and we go, yeah, I'm a Christian. Went to church. Yeah. As a disciple here, we call that excitement for Jesus, being consumed with Jesus. Can you say that tonight? Are you consumed with Jesus? Are you consumed with Jesus? That's his, that's his hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's what he's saying. Are you consumed with me? So if you can't remember that day, I want to extend an invitation to you tonight to repent and believe the gospel. Be filled with the Spirit so that you would leave here stoked, consumed with Jesus, excited. Because when Jesus comes, listen to this, our heart, our heart soars with excitement. It's nothing mundane about the righteousness of Jesus showing up. Verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. All right, let me define mercy for you in this context. Mercy is compassion for the miserable. Let me say it again. Mercy is compassion for the miserable. We were miserable in our sin, kicked out of the garden in curse, and Jesus showed compassion on us, right? He shows up, walks perfectly, and dies at a cross. He showed mercy on the miserable. And now we are to bless and serve the miserable. You know, who is that? Who's the miserable around you? It's not a rhetorical question. Who's the miserable around you? Are we not watching? What? Neighbors, family, what's, what's going on with them? They're sinners. They're in need of love. They're in need of compassion. Or there's folks who can't take care of themselves. That's the oppressed in the Bible, right? Jesus says, that's who I came for. Those who take, can't take care of themselves, the miserable the oppressed, the, those in need of love, the broken, the sinner. Mercy that receives God's blessing is not just that we feel compassion, but then that we act. Everybody catch that? Mercy is not mercy until we act. It's not a feeling inside of you. Oh, my God, look at, those, look at that mother beating the tar out of her kids. Had I not prayed, and if we had not been in moving vehicles at about 40 miles an hour, we probably would have got involved there. Would have been action. We act. Right. I'm about to talk about that. <laughs> when I was sharing the gospel on death row a few years ago, um, convicted killer Stanley Hall was miserable. And Stanley Hall wasn't miserable because he was sentenced to die. He had confessed his guilt. 
confessed his guilt to me, said, this sentence is just. He wasn't miserable because he was about to die. He was miserable because he needed mercy, not mercy from the state of Missouri. He needed mercy, capital M. And I didn't just say to Stanley, you know what, be well, I'll pray for you. I gave up some time for Stanley Hall. Gave up some time for a killer on death row. So we got together again a few times, and right before his execution, I got to be with Stanley Hall. And here's long story short, I finally had to chase him back to have his final, final meal with his wife and his mom. He trusted my mercy. And he didn't trust Tim in his mercy. He trusted the Jesus that directed my mercy. And he confessed Jesus as Savior right before he went back to have his last meal with his mother and his wife. And I don't know if I've ever quite gone to bed that satisfied in the middle of horrified as I knew at midnight as I just laid there praying that Stanley was hopefully going to go see Jesus because what he said actually happened. Let me just tell you this. You get stories like that in your soul, blessings of heaven on earth when you don't judge other sin as greater than yours. Do I track with that? Like when we stop sitting on the judgment throne, like, which I could have done in that situation. Uh, Stanley's a killer. He's on death row. He deserves to die. Even he admitted that. But your life cries out mercy. So open your home. Feed sinners. Hug the brokenhearted. Give your life up for the miserable. Jesus did. That's why you're sitting here. Because you were the miserable. Don't just talk about it. Once again, though, is the idea that if forgiveness and compassion are not the norm for us, we may not have ever received God's mercy. We may just be giving lip service to being a Christian. My my, my plea for you tonight is to set down your pride and fall before a holy God, poor in spirit. Repent and believe. Be filled with his spirit. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let me start on the second half of that. For they shall see God. I've watched some of you do that. Like, there's this thing that comes when the Spirit comes and we're around and we're actually in the presence of Jesus where you, you attain a clarity about what is holy, that you ta- attain a clarity about what is pure in heart. You shall see God. That is quite a promise. Because it's not talking about just in heaven. Everybody reads that, oh, yeah, we'll see God in heaven. It's talking about right now. We would set our eyes on Jesus and see his incredibleness, his everythingness, as we said earlier. So one of the immediate blessings of coming of life and regeneration and a filling of the Spirit is like being blind and suddenly I can see. I think Jesus, that was his most common miracle because he wanted us to have that visual of these blind people actually not being able to see anything and then technicolor vivid sight because that's what happens for you spiritually it's what happens when you actually see God when you're a sinner you can't see him you might talk about him listen to me you might talk about him people around you out there in our culture might talk about him but you, they can't see him you get to let me let me tell you how good it is you get to walk into the throne room of grace because of the work of Jesus and look upon God Kanoah read uh, Revelation or didn't read Kanoah recited Revelation 5 to us as we were preparing to to do this tonight, right? And in that thing, we get to see Jesus, the spotless lamb. John is giving us a picture of Jesus. That's amazing. And, and, And a not yet believer would hear that because they can't see God and go, so? I heard it and want to start jumping up and down and screaming and hollering, where is he? Let's do it now. Let's do it now. Is that the way you feel about Jesus? I want to see God. 
And then we get to see, because we can see God, what is pure. Have you ever had these revelations when you're reading the Bible? Oh my God, I didn't know that. I didn't know that was the, that's pure. I've been, I've been, then you start seeing your sin because you go, oh my gosh, I had no idea. I mean, I'll never forget, I, I was with a, a lady who had been a church member for 20 years one time. She had, was recently divorced and, and she was struggling a little bit with her loneliness and she goes, I can't sleep with men? I mean, like, like I'm not hurting anybody. I'm not killing anybody. I, can, I can't. And I go, no, 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 there's a purity that, that doesn't exist there. And she couldn't see it. And so I thought, man, I don't know. I've been in church 20 years, but I'm not sure you can see God. Because when you can see God, his purity just strikes you. And you go, okay, something's got to change here. And we go, it's great. It's good for me. God's rules are good for me. They keep me from destroying myself. They keep me from having a wife look at me who's not sure she trusts me sometimes. And I'm going, yeah, I need pure in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. But you see what is wrong in your own life with increasingly great, great clarity. You don't. It's like we learn in gospel-centered life. You don't actually sin less, but you see your sin with vivid clarity. I would ask you tonight, can you see your sin with vivid, vivid clarity? You're actually sinning less, but you see it clearly let me encourage you sin is death you better find it Genesis 4 says that sin is crouching at your door that's for you Satan wants to kill you sin is crouching at your door to destroy you hate sin run from sin turn sin over to the cross and to the resurrection Ask God to root it out of your life. It's, it's, it's death. It's the opposite of everything that we are. Blessed are the pure in heart. Let me say it again. Blessed, you want eyes, God's eyes set on you? You must hate sin. We must run from sin. We must turn from sin. We must find out what sin is. And then we get to see God. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. <laughs> blessed are the peacemakers. For they shall be called sons and daughters of God, right? So, so I had a question for you online this week. Are you a peace faker because you run from conflict? That's somebody that looks like a peacemaker, but they just run from conflict, right? A peace breaker, fists firing all the time. That's a peace breaker. Are you a peacemaker? That's somebody who's thriving in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, thriving in the ministry of reconciliation. Because they really have a desire for peace with people. Enemies, listen to me, enemies and friends alike. Peace fakers think that they're peacemakers when all they are is fury delayers. There's some fury coming somewhere down the road. I always tell my wife, her family, her family was famous, like the, the Skaggs family's famous for like piling up resentments, like underneath the carpet. And then they would never fail in their family as they piled those babies up. Here would come something that would crash on that giant mound under the carpet, and everybody for 40 miles around would gag on all the crap that came flying out from underneath that carpet. Because there were 40 years of resentment down there. And by the way, there's no, there's no living in heaven. There's no living with heaven. The kingdom of God, Jesus is saying, this is how you experience the kingdom of God on earth. Peace fakers don't actually exist in the kingdom of heaven. Because they were just sliding under the carpet. See, the prince of peace brings a desire for peace. <laughs> yeah? The prince of peace brings a desire for peace. We've been given the ministry of reconciliation by the king of the universe. That's quite a task. And that requires tough conversations. That's why you're at City on a Hill, because we're willing to have tough conversations. You guys understand that, right? is that we're willing to have tough conversations here. And we're praying that the Spirit of God would come in and, and say, don't run! Because sometimes tough conversations that are actually loving appear not loving if they're hitting flesh and there's a run. You're picking on me. You're being difficult on me. We've got to be peacemakers. Verse 10. Blessed are those who persecuted. 
That looks crazy, right? I mean, that just, that, that's an oxymoron. I mean, that's like jumbo shrimp right there, man. Like, right? Makes no sense. Government intelligence. Blessed, blessed, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Let me just put it this way. If you're not being persecuted for your faith, then probably nobody knows where you stand. I always tell Christians who are not receiving any persecution, nobody knows you're a Christian. The name of Jesus is offensive. The name, yeah, yeah. The name of Jesus is offensive. So stand up for righteousness. Not your righteousness. Here's the problem is that most Christians stand up for their righteousness. I watch Christians on social media and I just cringe. Like, what are you doing? Stand up for Jesus' righteousness, not yours. Not the Republican Party. Not some government entity. Not some cause. Stand up for Jesus' righteousness. See, if you stand up for your righteousness, that just causes a need for peacemaking. Now we go back to the previous verse. That'll be funny later. Stand up for the righteousness of Christ. Tell people how good he is. Standing up for his righteousness. Tell people how good he is. Tell people how gracious he is. Tell people how glorious he is. How great he is. How great our Jesus is. Anybody going to agree with me? How great our Jesus is. How loving he is. How just he is. How perfect he is. When your defense is of righteousness for his fame, he just said blessings are yours. He just said, blessings are yours. Blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake, for my cause of righteousness. Persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. By the way, kingdom of heaven now. Kingdom of heaven here. Verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. It's quite a list when you get thrown in there, you know. It's quite a list when you get thrown in there. Sometimes I pray to be killed for the cause of Jesus. Anybody ever pray that? Like, like, like I would so be honored, Christ, if you would choose me to be numbered among the prophets who said, it is, I am not worthy to live for his glory name's sake. And we find out in the book of Revelation that they get to gather around the throne and say, yo, Jesus, let's go. You understand that's happening like right now. All of those who have been killed, those killed in Saudi Arabia and in, in the churches in Mecca right now, have been killed in the last 24 hours. More Christians that are sitting in this room were killed in the Middle East last night. You understand that. Persecution is real around the world, and this is for them. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and not only utter all kinds of evil, but deliver evil against you. For Christ's name's sake, on his account, let us be named among those who are willing. How about that? Can we at least say that tonight? As we take Holy Communion together, as, as Kanoa comes up and leads us in Holy Communion, can we just like go, count me in to be reviled for your name's sake? Because I want blessed. I want, I want his eyes on me. I want his goodness cast upon me. Rejoice and be glad, he says, for your reward is great in heaven. What's your reward? It's him. He is worth it. The reason you may not pray that tonight is you haven't deemed that Christ is worth it yet that hit the reward of him. We can all think, oh man, I finally get this cool stuff that I actually wanted here on earth. No, you just get massive amount of Jesus. Your reward is great. Is that enough? It is. I'm here to declare you tonight, you know, there's no diamonds, there's no jewels, it's not the stuff of this world. He is your reward. He is worth it. He is worth it. Say it with me. He is worth it. He is worth it. Glory be to God, he's worth it. Let's pray.